Welcome to the channel, everybody. Uh, we're really excited today because we're going to be talking about something that we get lots and lots of questions about, which is the 1031 exchange. And uh, we have an expert in the field. We've got Robert or Bob Levinson. Uh, Bob is a lawyer that works out of the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, Bob, you've done, you know, 1031 exchanges for the last 20 year, billions of dollars in exchange value. And uh, we really value your opinion. So welcome to the channel and thanks for being here. I think we're gonna just jump right in. So why don't we let you take reins of this presentation and we'll go from there. Thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, happy to be here and talk about my favorite section of the tax code. Everyone should have a favorite section of the tax code and it should be section 1031. Um, so why? Well, because more, more, more is what you get as an investor from 1031 exchanges. Uh, so you'll get more cash flow if you are rearranging your portfolio. And so it's for when you're selling an investment property, you can get more cash flow, you can have more equity, and you can be closer to your financial freedom from working with us on a section 1031 tax divert exchange. So, uh, so the 1031, just so that I'm clear, because new for me too, it's a tax deferral. It's not getting rid of the taxes. It's just a deferral in sorts, right? Well, it can get rid of it pretty much forever, depending on the situation, until there's a taxable event, such as a sale. Okay. Say swap till you drop. So you can do a 1031 exchange on a particular investment property every 10 years or something like that. And if you own it when one passes away, then your people take at a stepped up basis. Okay. Uh, it, that's a little out of the range of this particular conversation, but we can do more on that later. Awesome. That's great. All right. So let's move on to the second slide here. So just a quick look at this is the example of the increased buying power. If someone sells for $350,000, no mortgage in this example, a uh, simplified example. Uh, they've owned it for a long time, so they may pay about 90 grand in taxes. Well, they'll have 230 left to put down on a replacement property. But would they, if they, that's if they do a sell, a taxable sale, and then buy a new one. Right. If you do a 1031 exchange, it's a rollover where you can legally avoid or defer those taxes and have an extra $90,000 to have $325,000 down. If you're putting a third down, instead of buying a $750,000 replacement property, you can have the same leverage and buy a $975,000 property. Or That's you can buy the same property that you were planning on anyway and just have less leverage. That makes it safer. So the, is there a certain percentage that is used to calculate the the tax? I guess that's a capital gains tax, right? It's uh, There's two components at least. There's recapture of depreciation and there's um, and there's capital gains tax in this in this math that I was just doing, I was just saying, hey, if you're putting a third down, so I was using that as a re reinvestment example. And it's, it's yeah, it's a ninety thousand dollar swing in how much money you have moving into the next property. That that buys a lot of extra equity, right? It really does. And and it, that's that number is totally depends on on your personal each taxpayer situation i definitely have people who legally avoid or defer a million dollars or more and it's still a pretty excellent uh value if someone is legally avoiding or deferring 30 grand in taxes to have an extra 30 grand to put down you know if you're buying something here in the villages for two three four hundred thousand mm -hmm. extra 30 grand is is real money yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I didn't mention it at the beginning, but there is a big difference between buying and selling properties normally. And what I mean by that is you, we would use a title company. In a 1031 exchange, you need a specialist involved, which is where you come in, correct? That's correct. We work with any title company. Any title company can be your title company, your regular title company, even if they're not that familiar with the 1031 so we're a layer, the 1031 documents are a layer that goes on top of a regular settlement, whether you're on the buy side or on the sell side, uh, to transform it from a taxable sale into a tax deferred exchange. 
and you can't do it without a specialist. Like you need someone like yourself involved. That's correct. And uh, the taxpayer is not allowed to have actual or constructive receipt of the funds when they sell their relinquished property. Okay. Selling. That sounds like legal jargon to me. Explain that a little bit more. <laughs> relinquished property is the yeah. one you're selling. Okay. Replacement property is the one you're buying. You can sell multiple and buy multiple replacements. So if you sold one property for, I'll just use this one, I guess, three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and you have a net of three twenty-five, you can go and put a hundred and you know one hundred and sixty thousand dollars down on two different properties. If you're selling one and buying two, people use the exchange when it's time to rearrange their portfolio, and you can buy anywhere in America. Hey, if you're moving from uh, you know from D.C. down to Florida, um, you can rearrange your portfolio by doing that, and you don't have to pay the tax. You really don't want to leave it up here in the you know in D.C. or in Kansas where you spent much of your life because now you're re uh, rearranging your life so you're down in Florida. You can do that without having to pay taxes. Okay, and we might get into it a little bit further along in the presentation, but it has to be an investment to an investment, not your personal property to an investment. We're absolutely going to get into that. I think that right in the next slide. All right, let's move forward here. All right. Here Thank you. Oops. There we go. So why sell by a 1031 exchange? First of all, it's for properties that are held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment. In English, usually I just say, a rental property, but it's also for business property. So if you own uh, an office condo where you have your engineering firm or where you own a restaurant and you own the real estate earlier this year, I did it with a guy who had had for 25 years, he had operated his garage uh, car repair business. So he sold for a couple million bucks and he bought six uh, townhouses and he's living off that uh, income from the cash flow. So if he had sold for about 4 million bucks, he would have had to pay a million dollars in taxes. Instead, he had an extra million dollars, which probably got him two more townhouses. Instead of getting four townhouses, he had six townhouses, right. a lot more cash flow. That's interesting. I didn't know that you could actually um, sell a business and use the 1031 exchange. That's new to me. It's the real estate aspect of it. So the real estate portion of the sale. Okay. So it wouldn't be the, if you were running a business and it was not connected to bricks and mortar, would that be something that you could do for a 1031? So no, it's, no, it's also called sometimes a like kind exchange. So like kind refers to real estate and it means how it's held, held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment. And you can go from, you know, a business property to just rental real estate. Um, and it's for the real property. Right. Yeah. And I think that this presentation, we're going to be um, showing this to owners in the villages, Florida. And these people have purchased homes as investment properties. And they're looking to either sell that investment property and buy another one. Or like you said, maybe sell one and buy two in order to increase their overall equity and uh, their cash flow from two properties instead of one property. Sure. If you bought them for 150 or 200 and now they're at 400. And again, in my simplified examples, I'm just examples are not going to have a mortgage um, in most of the examples. And then you've got, you sold it for 400. Why not put $200,000 down on two of them? You get a little more leverage, but 50% down still might be pretty safe. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a little bit more depreciation. And uh, also people use it for estate planning. Uh, so, you know, one one for Huey, one for Dewey, instead of having to sell it and split the funds, maybe the, one of them will want to keep being a landlord, a property owner, and right. the other one will need the cash, you know, to buy a new Maserati. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. always a good option too. <laughs> All right. So what do we got on this side? Tax deferment, tax liability, improved cash flow, property acquisition, investment diversification, qualified intermediary. That would be you, correct? That's right. That's our role. So tax deferment. So the taxes are deferred uh, 
which I already was talking about a little bit. You can swap till you drop. You can do an, an exchange every time you need to rearrange your portfolio. Sometimes it's just time to sell the property. Maybe it's time to move to a different location around America because you're hunting where the best returns are. Or maybe you just uh, want to upgrade to an end unit um, uh, or something right on the golf course instead of blocks away. Right. Uh, so whatever that is for the rental. Okay. Uh, in terms of the tax liability, we mentioned that briefly, that there's depreciation is this idea is the tax benefits on your rental where uh, I'm not going to go into the depreciation right here, but that's at the time that you do, if you did a taxable sale, you would have to give back the benefits of depreciation that you had enjoyed over a number of years uh, because that kind of assumes the property is being used up. But if in fact the property went up in value, then you have to recapture that depreciation and pay tax on that at the rate of 25% to the feds. Right. Plus the capital gains. Right. 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 Okay. Um, but if you own it at the time of passing, uh, then your people inherit it at a stepped up basis and no one ever pays those taxes. Wow. Um, okay. So improved cash flow, more buying power if you have a higher down payment because of the 1031 exchange, as we touched on earlier. Um, property acquisition is just time to get a new property or to get multiple properties. Um, investment diversification is pretty self-explanatory as well. I did want to touch on the more buying power because it's interesting, in, and I'm just going to slide up to this first slide real quick. But if you have an additional $90,000 going onto um, a new property, that decreases the amount that you owe. So therefore your, your payments would be lower. So in, you know, in an increasing environment of interest rates, the more money you can put into a property, the better. So to, to be able to do a tax deferral, use that cash to reduce your over overall loan. If that's what you're going to do, that's a huge advantage. Absolutely. Dave, another aspect of that is let's say that there are two properties right next to each other for rent and they're substantially similar. Uh, if your neighbor has got an extra $100,000 mortgage than you do in a competitive rental environment, you can charge a lower rent and still be in good shape because you have $90,000 less in mortgage. Right, your expenses so are lower. Your expenses are lower, but also you can charge a lower rent. So if there's one person looks at both properties, they're more likely to take yours because you're charging you know, $2,300 and they're charging 2500 Right, right. So yeah. it gives you competitive advantages any way you slice it. Awesome. Okay, good. So our role is the qualified intermediary. Uh, and actually that where it says before close is the 1031 exchange documents have to be in place at or before the settlement. Uh, so as soon as you get the property under contract, you want to be contacting your qualified intermediary. Um, you can... Uh, and many people call me, many of my taxpayers call me as soon as they're thinking of or getting ready to put it on the market. They want to educate themselves uh, a little more about the 1031. So they let us know they're thinking of doing it. And we talk to them. And sometimes there are things they want to do in advance. But very often we get calls with uh, settlements in a week or settlements in a few days. So that's more of a, you know, hurry it up. Um so, but I also get calls a couple of times a month for people saying, oh, they sold their property three weeks ago. They want to do a 1031 exchange. And that's just too darn late. Right. And those folks are going to pay the taxes. So when would be, let's say I own a property and I'm thinking, okay, I want to do a 1031 exchange. Um, when's the best time to give you a call to say, what do we need to do in order to make this move forward? Is it before I list my house for sale, before I go and purchase another property? Is it is it best to have you in place right at the beginning? Well, I mean, I think it is uh, people wanting to educate themselves, but we, we can pick it up and run with it anywhere along that, uh, along that time period, that spectrum, as long as it's before settlement. Do I think earlier is better? Sure. Right. Because it reduces the anxiety of the taxpayer 
and they are better able to plan. Uh, there are plenty of investors out there that are much more kick and run, and we'll get those calls just a few days before uh, settlement, and uh, you know we'll get them taken care of, and they're not necessarily going to get the same benefit of the of the counseling of the professional services that we can provide in talking it through, in separating the business issue from the 1031 issue. We can talk to them about how something on the 1031 side affects the business issue. And that's really where we're adding, you know, extra value uh, because a lot of 1031 guys, I think are just, they just do the paperwork and they don't do the, the counseling. Uh, we are not allowed to give legal or tax advice. And we, again, help people talk through the situation because everyone's a little bit different in terms of what they're looking to accomplish to achieve their financial freedom, to get better cash flow, to do some estate planning, et cetera. Well, and I think that if you're moving from one property to another and then and the, the purchase, you're going to have a mortgage. It's important for the mortgagor to understand how much money is coming into the down payment. So, you know, that's all going to be figured out by you as the intermediary to say, this is how much money you're going to defer so that you can tell the, the lender, you know, this is the down payment I'm going to have. Then they can figure out their closing costs accurately and you know exactly where you stand. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So um, on to the next uh, yeah. one and actually um, uh Let's go on down one more and we'll okay. come back to this one if you'd be so kind, Dave. Thank you. So at the settlement, the taxpayer cannot have actual or constructive receipt of the funds. Uh, so remember we're transforming, uh, it's basically a, a barter. So a barter is non-taxable and a 1031 exchange transforms your sale into a barter. Okay. You're trading one property for two new properties, a relinquished property for two replacement properties, for example. So, um, excuse me, instead of getting a, um, a big old publisher's clearinghouse size check uh, at your settlement or, or getting a wire, they'll wire the funds to us and we'll hold them as uh, federal 1031 as qualified intermediary for Anderson. We'll hold it in an exchange escrow account under your name uh, under your social security number at the bank, you can, yes, use an LLC. Uh, so we'll get that set up. We'll get a W-9 from you and we'll hold it under your exchange escrow account. And then when you go to buy your replacement property, let's say there is a mortgage. Let's say that uh, $300,000 example we used above, they're buying a new property for $500,000 and they're getting a $200,000 bank loan. All we need is a copy of the contract and the contact information for the settlement attorney or title company. Right. The bank will wire in their $200,000. We'll wire in your $300,000 and the title will go directly to you. The deed, it'll be directly deeded to you with our paperwork and a regular settlement. Uh, our basic fee for that is $895 for a round trip one sale, one purchase. Right. So it's pretty amazingly uh, good value. Uh, you know, whether you're legally avoiding or deferring 30 grand in taxes or 90 grand in taxes or more. Right. Right. Basically, you know, for larger transactions, commercial transactions, transactions with a little more hair on them, mm -hmm. uh, but usually above a million three, a million four it might be just a couple hundred dollars more. So it's still amazing value. Um, so taxpayer cannot have actual or constructive receipt of the funds. And like kind, it's sometimes called a like kind, it really means any property exchange for any other real property. 1031 exchange does not care about the difference between residential, commercial, or industrial property. So I mentioned a gentleman sold uh, a, a garage. I think he had four or five bays. So he sold that property and he bought a commercial property and he bought um, residential rental real estate, just straight rental real estate. Right. And okay. you, you can't go down in value though, right? It has to be. Well, you can, yes, do a partial. That's perfect. A uh, transition to the next point it says in order to be completely tax deferred, 
the taxpayer must trade up or trade even in debt and trade up or trade even in equity, less allowable exchange expenses. So let me spend a few minutes on that. Okay. So let's go back to that uh, $300,000 sale, $325,000 sale. And let's say there was a $100,000 mortgage on it. So in order to be completely tax deferred, so again, kind of ignoring closing costs or simplifying, we're going to end up with, uh, what do you say, three, $350,000 sale, $100,000 mortgage. Oops. We're going to end up with um, $250,000. Uh, i am just going to leave it at that, $250,000 in yeah. mm -hmm. $100,000 mortgage. So, excuse me. In order to be completely tax deferred on the new property, they have to match the $100,000 mortgage or add new outside cash so they can take $100,000 out of their savings, yeah. but trade up or trade even in debt and trade up or trade even equity. Use all of their $250,000 in exchange funds, in equity, in proceeds. Okay. Uh, so less allowable exchange expenses. So I've over, here's a place where I've oversimplified where I said you're selling for three fifty with a hundred thousand dollar mortgage payoff, and that leaves you with two fifty in equity and a hundred in uh in debt payoff. Right. So really let's just say that you'll end up with you know two hundred and two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Yeah. The broker's fees, transfer and irradiation costs, uh seller. Uh, subsidy or, you know, decorator allowance or whatever. Yeah, all those closing costs. That lower number is what you have to match. Okay. So you don't have to put money out of your pocket. So let's say we end up with 220 in proceeds wired to federal 1031 as qualified intermediary for Anderson. We end up with 220. You don't have to put in that 30,000 out of your pocket. Most of my people don't add in any additional cash some do right some people say i've got a hundred thousand i don't really want no stinking mortgage i'm going to just take a hundred thousand out of my schwab account out of my fidelity account so we're just going to buy for 330 or whatever it was three hundred twenty thousand for cash and you can even buy a little bit less than that uh, because it's less allowable exchange expenses usually there's maybe about two percent uh rule of thumb maybe two percent costs on the buy side right so right. So if on 330, that's like 6,000, 7,000. So you could sell for 350 and maybe end up buying for, you know, 320, 323, something like that. And uh, I'm sorry, did I? Yeah, 317, uh, maybe even a little less and be completely tax deferred. Right, right. But and you could I still call it the trade up or trade even rule. Right. Some people would say, okay, we've got uh, 250000 in, or well, to go with the two twenty, two hundred twenty thousand in equity, but we want to put 50% down or the area that we know we want or the amenities that we know we want. We want an end unit. We want it to be near the pool and near the golf course. Maybe that's going to be 440, 450. Right. Uh, so they know, all right, so we'll put a 50% mortgage on it. We're still putting 220 down. So that's why. Some people are all cash people, and some people will say, you know, I'm a young Turk. I'm only 61. I'm going to be aggressive. I'm going to put 25% down, yeah. and I'm looking for, uh, you know, an $800,000 property. Right, right. Or I want to put $50,000 down on four 200s or whatever it is that they're doing. So that's where the individuality comes in, and the 1031 gets tailored for you and what meets your financial investing needs. But you really, like, from what I understand, you have to use every dollar of that exchange into the next property. You can't say, you know, I'm going to take a deferral of 200000 but only use 100 of it on the next property and put 100 in my pocket. That doesn't happen. Not quite. I'm glad you, you know, persisted because if I didn't quite address that. So actually, uh, you can, yes, do a partial 1031 exchange. So uh, today, actually, we sent out a check to someone for $6,000. We had $6,000 left after they bought their replacement property. Uh, so they'll end up paying maybe 
maybe two thousand dollars in taxes on that. So you can yes do a partial ten thirty one. It is not purely pro rata. So if someone had no mortgage, sold for three fifty, um, the it depends on their basis. They really want to ask their accountant to do a tax analysis without mentioning the 1031 exchange because people kind of latch onto that and that's kind of off point. Right. And and they'll think about the 1031 exchange and they'll like many accountants are tax preparers who don't really know a lot about 1031 exchange, but just say, if I don't, if I just sell this property, how much tax am I going to pay? So you, um, <laughs> Two different people will pay a very different. If I paid two hundred seventy-five thousand for that three hundred fifty thousand dollar property, I'm going to pay a much different tax than if I bought it a long time ago for seventy-five thousand dollars. Sure. Yeah. In the same way, the tax benefits will be different, and basically, you're not going to get any tax benefit on the ten thirty one exchange until you at least buy as much real estate as is your basis. Right. Yeah. which again is kind of an advanced uh, real estate investor concept to talk to your accountant about, Hey, what's my basis in the property. Right. Okay. And that may be even a different uh, presentation that we would do a, a different video about just basis. Yeah. Because I know that before we started recording, we had a, a small discussion about um, foreign ownership and, and providing a 1031 exchange for say a Canadian like myself could I do that and I think we've decided that we're going to do a separate video on 1031 exchanges for foreign interest if that makes more sense hey, that sounds like a good idea that'll yeah. be a separate video yeah okay so stay tuned for that one right <laughs> awesome all right next slide uh, actually go up uh, right go up, all right there we go. Okay, and let's see. Let's go through these, and I probably have already covered some of it. Mm -hmm. So, transform a taxable sale into a tax deferred exchange. <laughs> it's so. I did say held for productive use in a trade or business or for investments, but I didn't talk so much about not personal use. So again, this is also where a lot of detail, uh, a, a lot of variance, you know, depends on the person and their usage. Mm -hmm. So you actually absolutely can stay there a couple of weeks, you know, again, talk to your accountant. Can I use it for personal use for, uh, you know, I want to go down for two weeks at Christmas with my family. Yeah. It's got to be rented. It's fine. 1031 is fine with uh, Airbnb or VRBO or rental programs. Um, and it's just got to be defined as not personal use. So if I bought a condo for my daughter who's away at college at uh, Virginia Tech, that's personal use. Right. I buy a place at the beach and I stay in it, uh, you know, maybe a couple months on and off of weeks, weeks at a time here and there throughout the year, but never rent it out. That's personal use. Right. Some things are more gray area. <clears throat> yeah, because a lot of people in the villages there, they'll have a, a house that is rented out January, February, and March because of the prime months. And then what they'll do is they'll do short-term rentals throughout the year for the other nine months. But in between that, there's going to be a, a week or two or a month that they'll go and spend time there or they'll send their family there. I, I suspect that's not called personal use. Well, that part would be personal use okay. if you're using it or if your kids are using it or family members. You want to talk to your accountant and plan very carefully for that because there are restrictions on that. And it may be that it's as simple as, uh, you know, paying yourself income and paying tax on that income when a family member uses it. Right. Uh, but that's really, we do not give legal or tax advice. You want to talk to your accountant about that and structure your situation so that you can, yes, do a 1031 exchange. And it may be that you want to tighten up in the, so this is, we talked about getting in touch in advance, excuse me, maybe that you want to tighten up your personal usage and eliminate yep. your personal usage 
in the two or three years before you do a 1031 exchange. Yeah. If you see on the horizon that you're thinking, well, it's time to, you know, to rearrange your portfolio. It's time to turn this one over and get a different one uh, for, you know, we're tired of this village and we want to move to that village. Right. Or heaven forbid someone buying something outside of the villages. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, uh, to start planning a little bit in advance and stop or dramatically reduce your personal usage, that's entirely possible. And really, you want to talk to your accountant about that. So another personal use is sometimes family members live in it without paying rent. So it's fine to rent to a family member and they got to pay rent. It's we charge the in-laws more? Pardon? Can I charge the in-laws more? Yes, dear. You may. <laughs> uh, the example I was going to give was that, you know, if I still live up in Virginia and my uh, my child lives down in the property and maybe they're renting out a couple of the rooms, uh, you know, or other people do it to have their parents living in the property uh, to charge them rent, either on paper where you're really doing it Again, confer with your accountant. Right. And it's showing up as rental income. Uh, and you're really putting it into your rental income account and you're paying taxes on that so that it is a rental property as, as it is accounted for on your taxes, on your Schedule E. Yeah. Uh, so that's not personal use. So that's something you want to think about and plan for. Yeah, I think that what you're really saying is to make sure you have a team of people that are working with you, an accountant, a lawyer, uh, yourself doing the exchange. Like it's not just a simple process. There's there's thought and there's planning that has to be done in order to make this advantageous to the, to the person that's doing the exchange. Absolutely. And some of it you're going to be doing already. In other words, you've already got an accountant or, or a tax attorney that you're talking about your rental properties and perhaps other business matters. Right. Um, so sometimes plenty of people just use TurboTax and you just want to drill down a little bit more and as long in, in advance as you can. So ownership as well is an issue that you might need to change uh, or, or adjust. Uh, uh, Dave, if you and I own a property together, a rental property, we might own it in one LLC. Right. Well, it could be that we're thinking about selling three years from now and um, I'm not doing a 1031 exchange. I want the cash. But Dave, you definitely want to do a 1031 exchange. Right. So uh, we might want to rearrange uh, our structure of our uh, our business co-ownership. So, um, yeah, so one can do the exchange and the other one can cash out. That's right. Right. Hmm, interesting. All right. So what do we got here? Uh, so, uh, exchange documents in place before settlement. At or before settlement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, once the transaction settles on your relinquished property, the one that you're selling, you have 45 days to identify one or more replacement properties, and you may only acquire properties from that list. You may not change that list after midnight on day 45. So by midnight on day 45, you're going to send us a notice of identification form filled out. We'll send you the form, and you're going to fill it out, and you can only buy from that list of properties and 180 days to close. Hmm. The 45 days and the 180 days begin the same day, the date of settlement of your relinquished property. So and when you, when you identify the properties that you're looking to acquire, uh, is that by address or by tax rule number or how does that get identified? So good question. Uh, you would identify it, it's a simple identification simply by address is fine. And there's a bifurcation between the 1031 requirement, which is really easy. You're putting an address on a piece of paper, the notice of identification form, you're signing it, you're dating it, and you must send it and we must receive it before midnight on day 45. Hmm. And in the real world, if there's a busy market, and I write a piece of write an address on a piece of paper and send it to Bobby. That doesn't get you anywhere with respect to the subject property. I have nothing to do with that seller of the property you're interested in acquiring. So you've so the 1031 requirement is really easy, and you really need to get busy in the real world. Especially, I got plenty of people who find the property and end up closing on a property 
that they found on day 42. They found that last weekend uh, when they finally had time to turn their attention to focus on the acquisition of their replacement property. Um, and uh, if there are other people in the market, if it's a busy market, if there's not that much inventory, you need to write offers uh, because the 1031 does not give you rights in that subject property. So a question on that then, can I purchase a property without identifying it as long as I'm within the 45 days? So anything acquired within the 45 days is presumed identified, is right. operationally identified. Because I know that the, the market a couple of years ago, and even to some degree still, that you might identify a property that's available today and it'll be gone tomorrow, right? Which is why I'm, I'm pointing out that's right, that there's a difference. So that 45 days does go pretty quickly. Yeah. However, let's reframe a little bit. If you're, if someone's writing an offer to you, uh, maybe they're going to do a 30-day close. Is that pretty common down here? Yep. A 30-day close. So you've really got 75 days. So you've got time before the settlement where you're, you could be looking for a property, narrowing down the type of property that you're looking for. Uh, you could be writing offers. Um, and uh, so yeah. 45 days. Yeah. Depending on when your close is, it'll give you that extra time. Right. And if you're not sure, maybe you could put into the contract, uh, you know, uh, seller reserves the right to delay the settlement by two weeks, you know, up to 10 days or whatever, for any reason or no reason. Yeah. Uh, in sellers complete and absolute discretion. So you can get a few more days. Yeah. Uh, you don't really want to say that it's because of the 1031 exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, the 21st century is busy. There's a lot going on. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and then you have to close within 180 days of when you replace some property. Yeah, most people do close well within the 180 days. The only time, mostly, that it goes out that far is uh, pre-construction. So if you're looking at a pre-construction property for your replacement, be darn sure that it's going to close within that 180 days. Right. Uh, right. I've had a lot of closings on day 177 with pre-construction, but I've also had some people miss the deadline. <laughs> no, well, I, could, I, I could I could see a scenario where you identify a pre-construction property that you're 60 days into the process and then they tell you that they're not going to close so now you don't have any property to close on that's why I encourage people to, to identify backups and yeah. also with respect to pre-construction you know be sure they're far enough along um, so you can't just buy something that's closing a year and a half from now because it's a brand new project Right. That's not a good property for a 1031 exchange. Um, and we'll just go off topic just a little bit, but it might be important if someone's looking at purchasing a, a condo property where you may get occupancy, but not closing. And occupancy can last six to eight to 12 months. And that would really put you in a bind. I'm not quite sure what you're saying where there's a tenant's rights that can slow down the settlement? Is that what you're talking about? Well, I'm thinking that sometimes when you purchase new condominiums, the, the condominium board hasn't been created. So they'll allow you to occupy the property, but not actually officially close on the property. Yeah, that, that dog don't hunt. You you yeah. really can't do that unless you can take title to the property. Yeah. Right, so okay. That's other good. things that can, uh, short sales can take too long, mm -hmm. uh, foreclosure, probate divorce situations. So certain specialty situations can take too long and cause problems on the 1031 side. And there's also some, you know, uncertainty. Uh, are they going to redeem? Are they going to, is something else going to happen? Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, a foreclosure sale, that, that might be a quick, or maybe if it's already bank owned, that may be they're ready to sell and it's quick. Right. Or a short sale uh, or other specialty situations. Uh, especially where you cannot change your list. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely a risk. And it's, you know, it could be a, a very uh, expensive risk when you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars of deferred equity. So, yep, a big tax liabilities if you don't, you know, get the right property. So, yeah. okay. couple, two, moving on to two other things. The very bottom line here mm -hmm. the taxpayer that sells must be the taxpayer that buys. I'm just okay. going to talk about that for a minute and we can talk about it more. 
in another video, uh, the same taxpayer that sells must be the taxpayer that buys. You know, Joseph and Mary uh, each had their own house and they got married and they, they moved into Mary's house, but they kept Joe's house as a rental. And now it's 10 years later and they're time to sell it. Of course, Joseph, they want, they want, they think of it at the informal level, it's their property. Um, but Joe's the only one on title. Right. So the same taxpayer that sells must be the taxpayer that buys. Okay. So when he buys his replacement property, in general, that's going to be for Joe. Now, uh, he's going to have to take title to the replacement property. Now, you can get uh, most of these situations, there are workarounds uh, or there are adjustments you can make. So, for example, it may be that, uh, that Mary would end up as a 1% owner of the new property and maybe they would pay, you know, $400 in taxes. Right. Right. You know it is, uh, or they could wait till the exchange is old and cold. And you have to ask your accountant or your attorney, how long that is. It would be a year, could be two years. Um, and, and then a lot of times a transfer from a spouse to husband and wife is a non-taxable event. You got to talk to your title guys about that. Right, right. You could wait until two years from now and, you know, Merry Christmas, honey, I'm, I'm transferring title. Right. Or adding, adding. Happy Hanukkah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm transferring title so that we're both title holders on that property. Right, yeah. Could take title, Joe could take title in an LLC, a single member LLC that's a disregarded entity for federal tax purposes. Right. And he might uh, give her 50% again when the accountant gives the blessing. Right. And these are some things we might talk about in a in a future kind of advanced uh, 1031 class. Yeah, because and just so that our, our viewers know, there is going to be an ongoing series with yourself about different parts of these uh, 1031 exchanges in more detail. This is this first video is really let's get the 30,000 foot view of what a 1031 exchange is. But there, there are some um, more details that need some drilling down. And we're going to do that in subsequent videos. So do we have a, just a few minutes to go over one more little set of yeah, we do. So scroll on down. I think it's the second one down the next one. Yeah. The next one more down. Okay. Okay. So I've already mentioned you have 45 days to identify from the date of settlement and 180 days to close. So at that for at, by midnight on day 45, you have to narrow it down from all possible properties in America down to a short list. And I'm only going to mention two of the three rules. Okay. Again, no changes after midnight on day 45. So the three property rules says you may identify one or two or three properties. This is usually if, you know, we're selling a $350,000 property, uh, we're getting $325,000, and, you know, I want to buy one uh, $600,000 property, about 50% loan to value. If you're getting a larger property or one that's about the same size, yeah. uh, you're probably going to use the three property rule. You can identify one or two or three. Maybe we get one under contract real quick, and there are two others in the same neighborhood that we put on our list, we don't have to call them. We don't have to tell them that they're they're um, on the list. You could do is you could um, put one of them under under an option, give them a thousand bucks, and say, "Well, don't, on property number two, right. don't close on this. I have sixty days. You keep the thousand bucks either way, but I have sixty days that you're not going to sell it to anybody else, right? So that you make sure that your favorite property." Right, right. Okay. Is the one that you get. So the next rule is where you're going from a higher price property to a lower price property. Okay. Someone lives somewhere else, uh, and they're set. They've they've sold it. They're selling a property, uh, you know, something in Brooklyn for a million two or something like that. Well, I don't even know if there are any properties in the villages for a million bucks. You know, maybe there are. But, there are. Yeah, there are. And if someone's buying them as rentals, they're saying, well. You know, I'm going to take my million two. I'm very fortunate. I don't have a mortgage on that. I want to put 300,000. I'm looking for four 
three hundred thousand dollar properties. Well, four right. is bigger than three, so you may not put you may not use the three property rule because if you could identify three properties and closed on all of them, you still would not have met your trade up or trade even if you buy three three hundred thousand dollar properties right. and you need to hit a million two. Okay. The two hundred percent rule says is from going from higher price properties to lower price properties, and you it allows you to get more properties on the list. Okay. You may identify any number of properties up to two hundred percent of the fair market value of the relinquished property. So I identified this. I identified this relinquished property in my example as a million two. So you can identify two point four million dollars worth of properties. Okay. So if you're identifying, this is the list of what you're narrowing it down from all properties in America down to a short list by midnight on day 45. If I'm saying I'm looking at $300,000 properties, you can identify eight $300,000 properties. Yep. Okay. But you still have to close on four of them so that you've acquired a million twos worth. Because you have to use all of that asset. Because you're using, that's right, to be completely tax deferred. Yep. Okay. So that's the 200% rule, and it's a Boolean, either or. You use either the three-property rule or the 200% rule, and not both. There's not a hybrid. People put them together, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's it's one or the other, and most people use the three-property rule. They're just looking to acquire one or two properties. Right. Okay. It's pretty easy. Um, that's most of the first bit of it if you want to put up that last slide just for people to take a look at that one yeah that one so that's the statute uh so you can read through it and go through it and maybe we'll say that. no gain or loss shall be recognized on the exchange of property held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment of such property is exchanged solely for property of like kind which is to be held either for productive use in a trade or business or for investment and from that, I teach a three-hour class. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and then uh, last slide just has uh, my contact information for uh, if you want to call or contact me for uh, more detailed, a more focused, tailored conversation on your situation. Uh, I'm sure Dave is going to put our information in uh, uh, as well. In the video, yeah, I'll put it in there. So... Moving forward, we're going to do two or three more videos that drill down into this. Um, if people, you've got your information here, but let's say someone identifies tomorrow that they're going to go through this. Is it is it a fairly straightforward process once they've made that decision and they're following the rules? It seems like there's a, a definite um set of standards or rules that you would follow as long as they contact you, you're going to guide them in the process. Sure. And that's where some people it's, it's very straightforward. And that's where the consultation piece comes in. Uh, if I'm conversing with somebody and uh, I'll ask them about, you know, what are you going to do with the funds? Do you know where you're going? Is there a mortgage on the property? Uh, these kind of things, because I'm, looking to issue spot yeah figure out where is the specialty area to discuss a little bit more with them uh, and like i said some people it's very vanilla and other people you know i'll find out at the last minute oh oh it's owned in a you know oh it's owned in a trust well what right. does that mean? depends yeah. um, same taxpayer that sells must be the taxpayer that buys so i have someone who sold in an LLC that they've owned for many, many years, actually a repeat customer. And she sent me an email saying, oh, we created a new LLC. Well, in her particular situation, there's an issue with that. So I wrote to them, she checked with her accountant and they're using the original LLC. They might change it, but they're going to change it two years from now. Right. Not right now. Well, and I think that like in the, my case, it's what I don't know. Like I... I have to learn what you're talking about. And sometimes not knowing is more dangerous than knowing. So, well, well, that's part of where the conversation comes in. So 1031 exchange is not for flips. Yeah. I definitely have gotten 
you know, a handful of times a year where I get told about the exchange at the last minute, we do the exchange, and I'm not talking to the taxpayer until, you know, three weeks into it. And I find out, oh, oh, they only owned it for four months. Right. Well, the 1031 is no good. But they didn't know that because we didn't talk beforehand. Right. Right. And that's okay, but it's just uh, I'm making up examples on the fly. Yeah. Uh, a lot of other things come up. Again, it's about using this very sophisticated section of the tax code uh, for you. Yeah. To you achieve your financial dreams and goals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I agree with you. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time. I know that you've uh, had a busy day and you've sectioned off an hour for us. So we really appreciate that. The, the viewers will see this video and more to come. And I really, really want to say thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Dave. Appreciate being here. And uh, just give me a call anytime. And we'll talk about my favorite section of the tax code. Awesome. Appreciate it.